morning? Okay. Thank you, sir. Does everyone have an outline? Okay. The subject of today's lesson is, is no hope in hell, and it is uh, the conclusion uh, to our series that's been two or three months now, at least, on three, three months at least, on universalism. And though not every week we've talked specifically about universalism, the reason why I've, I've intended to spend so long on the subject is because it's not just universalism that's the issue, it's Christians' understanding of God's judgment, his atonement being applied, and in uh, the, the extent of and duration of eternity, and things like that. These issues permeate many different errors and mistakes, and quite frankly, a weak spot in Christians' understanding of the truth in our culture and in the church. And so that's why I spent so long on it, to try to communicate these doctrines, okay? Uh, no doubt you, have, you don't run into a universalist every day, although if you get out and about, it's more frequent than before, uh, seeing as that uh, over 50% of the population doesn't believe in hell and doesn't believe that people will go there, which means they're practically universalist, if not doctrinally so. So we need to know how to respond <clears throat> to, in a culture that promotes love over all uh, of anyone and any behavior, how a God of love can judge righteously in hell. So over the weeks we've talked about, just as a review here, what sinners deserve, which is the very heart of this issue. What do sinners deserve, and are we sinners or not? We don't have a lesson. If you don't understand that we're all sinners, and that sinners deserve not benefits and blessings, but judgment and punishment, then none of this is going to be understood uh, about what God is doing, and, and including salvation. If you don't understand sin, there's no need to be saved at all, and, and there's, there's no idea of being saved from it. And so what sinners deserve was, was right at the outset of our series. And then we just went to the Bible and superficially studied whether or not hell is a biblical idea and the concept. Is it there? Is, is hell exist or not? And because there's universalists that say it doesn't exist. And people in culture that say it doesn't exist. Well, the Bible teaches it does. And it does frequently. In fact, it's a very common subject in the Bible. So hell is there. And we talked about some of the descriptions about it in the scripture. And so throughout the series, we were constantly taking a Bible believing approach, or a Bible authoritative approach. What we believe about all of this is, is going to be based on what the scripture says, not based on our heart, not based on what we can reason in our mind, but based on what the Bible tells us. And uh, for some people that's offensive, including many universalists. It's just an offense to take the Bible as your authority. But that's, that's what we do, knowing it's the word of God. Without that, uh, we are lost at a sea of subjectivism in our own feelings. We talked about the need for faith which again, there's many errors out there that persist that will deny the need for faith to receive salvation, forgiveness, and what have you. And so faith was necessary, we talked about. Grace was a gift. We talked about what that meant. If grace is a gift, it's not forced on someone. It's freely received. It's not something God predetermines you're going to get it or not or forces it upon you, which, believe it or not, is a key component to much of universalism, that everyone is saved not because they actually believe and desire to, but God forces it on them for his own glory. And so grace in the Bible is a gift. It's given freely, it's received freely, or rejected freely. We talked about Paul. One of the reasons we talk about universalism in, in these subjects is because uh, Paul's verses and his teaching of God's abundant grace is actually one of the justifications and proof texts for these ideas. There's no hell. Paul never mentions the word hell, though he mentions judgment and, and vengeance and things like that. But so we dealt with Paul, uh, verses in Paul's epistles about whether or not he believes in God's righteous judgment and hell of the wicked and unbelieving. Uh, we dealt along with that the theme, the idea of reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation. When Paul preaches that and the church is to do it as our ministry, uh, what does that mean? Does that mean everyone's going to be saved? Which is what the universalism teaches. But uh, we talked about how God's actually trying to reconcile the universe to him, so heaven and earth together in Christ. And whether or not you are involved is, uh, is, is one part of the issue. It's not the whole issue. We dealt with three weeks there with Christ's atonement and how, uh, how Christ atoned for all. His atonement's been accomplished for all, and yet it's not applied to all unless you believe. And so we dealt with that for three weeks, what atonement was, how to think about atonement, uh, not in terms of financial payment, but rather a moral guilt and a moral atonement and that necessary bloodshed and how Christ made that atonement and how you receive it through faith. We dealt with that, which, again, is a cultural controversy of how Christ atones for sins. And then we started dealing with hell proper and how God's love in hell does not contradict, and which is usually at the, premise, the heart of the, the controversy, is how can a loving God send people to hell? And so we dealt with that in a lesson on how God's love and his wrath are not contradictory, 
In fact, if you love something, especially a righteous love for it, you at the same time uh, give wrath to those things that are against the things that you love. And so God's love and wrath are not contradictory, and they work together in, in God's unity. And we dealt with the judgments in hell, in our lesson on holy hell, and how when you go to hell, when God judges and people go to hell as a result, it's because of God's righteous judgment. It's not that he's overly, zealously angry, like you might go in a violent tirade or something. This is not the picture of God's judgment. God righteously judges and, and distributes blessing and curse and life or death accordingly. And so we dealt with those in hell and how they're judged and on what criteria and on what terms. And we, we dealt, I think, in that lesson um, of, of the idea that uh, God is unjust to send people to hell. Then we, we asked the question, is there anybody in hell? Does the Bible tell us who's in hell or not? And, of course, there's not a list in the Scripture. We don't have the Book of Life in front of us um, that gives all the names or, or, or not. But it does tell us that there's some people in hell, like some of them specifically. There's the devil, there's the, the beast, the false prophet, and, and, and such, so forth, and other uh, wicked folks in the Bible who die in their sin, who it says that they'll spend their time in, in condemnation and judgment. And so it does indicate that. And if there's only one person in hell, universalism is false. Okay? And God's a righteous judge. Amen. And we also dealt with babies in that lesson as well. That's a common question that comes up with babies. And how there's not a single baby uh, burning in hell uh, because they didn't commit sins. And we dealt with that in that lesson as well. We dealt last week with how long is hell, which is really the, the main offense that universalists have is the eternal nature of the condemnation and judgment and punishment. And does the Bible teach that or not? And so we dealt with some with the, the words that people play with and how they, they reject the Bible in, in this way. And the only way to reject eternal condemnation and judgment is if you change your Bible. It's the only way. And so we're seeing over and over again on these subjects that if you reject the word eternal, reject the word hell, and they just take it out of the Bible, and they do that in different translations, they do that in their own Bibles, then you, it will affect the doctrine you understand about God's judgment and hell. Okay? And so it matters. So this week I'd like to, to finish with this idea of, of whether there's hope in hell or not. Because as we've come through the series, we have removed, hopefully, if you're using the Bible as your authority, all of the arguments and all the misunderstandings about the reality of hell, and we've left the only option for the universalist, which does still exist, is that I believe everything, people believe everything that we've taught so far. There's hell, it's for judgment and punishment, it's not contrary to God's love, it's a righteous judgment, it's only applied to those that believe. Uh, if you get saved, which means if you don't believe, you go to hell, and they believe all that, and hell itself is eternal, but in hell, God will give you a second chance to be saved. This is the only remaining opportunity that's left biblically for, that they think for people to, to all be saved in the end is that they hope against hope that in hell you can be saved there. Okay? Well, and so we realize in the Bible it cannot be true that everyone's saved at the moment of death because people die rejecting God. They, they die without faith. We know that at the final judgment in Revelation 20, that not all people survive that in life. Like, there's like a fire and death. And so when? When does universalism happen? Their answer is after death. In fact, this is so-called Christian universalism. They call it themselves Christian universalism because they're trying to be accepted by Christianity, by those who understand the Bible, understand the Christian message for so long, and say, well, we can still believe all of those things and still be universalists if we maintain this optimistic hope that in the end, all will be saved. And by the in the end, they mean not the end of this life, but in hell. That we still hold the optimistic belief that in hell, people will be saved. In fact, everyone will be saved in hell. So this is the Christian universalist idea. And you say, well, this seems such like, like an arcane thought. I mean, first of all, who actually believes this? And it's, it's a growing small minority of people. But it's not really the reason we're covering it today. Because it also affects greater groups of people, like, say, the Roman Catholics, who believe not in this specific idea that all will be saved in the end, even though they leave that door open, but that there is an opportunity for a purging and restoration of souls in torment, otherwise known as purgatory. <laughs> And that's the doctrine that, that drives a lot of Roman Catholic actions, which is a lot of the things that they do is related to saving time from purgatory or getting out of purgatory, which is where they believe everyone, believer or not, goes. Like, well, unbeliever, there's all those that go to hell directly, but purgatory is those, that, even believers, the, 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 the saints, though they won't call them saints, go there to be purged from their sins. 
So what does the Bible say about this? What does God's word say about salvation from hell? And this is the irony, because they're trying to be Christian universal, they're trying to be biblical to believe all these doctrines up to this point, and they say, well, we're, we're still going to push it out to hell, being saved from that. What does the Bible say about that? Nothing. It says nothing about that. It doesn't teach that. In fact, it actually teaches the opposite. And so if it says nothing about it, at the very least, you can just maintain a naive hope. But if it teaches against it, what you're believing is wrong, right? And it's a false hope. And so this is the great irony is that God's word does not speak about salvation from within hell. Salvation from hell, salvation now so you don't go to hell, but salvation from within hell is not something the Bible teaches as an opportunity. Okay? So I want to deal with this hopefully in a few points. The first one being that this is a big dispensational problem. Now I know here I'm speaking to a dispensational audience, and so hopefully this has some, uh, some effect on you, but it won't for the majority of people who are not dispensational. Most universalists, though some of them will claim to be uh, dispensational, they'll draw some charts and things, are really not properly dispensational, as we'll see. Their universalism undermines it. Okay? But it's a dispensational problem. Uh, if you don't care about dispensational Bible study, this is not an issue for you. But it, I believe it's true. I think the Bible teaches that it's right, that God progressively reveals things and operates differently at different times in the Scripture and at different uh, uh, ages, throughout the ages, and through different, different dispensations. Okay? Last week, we, we pointed out very clearly that you cannot deny eternal condemnation and be a Bible believer of any Bible, particularly the King James Bible. Uh, but here, now you can't be a universalist, even the Christian variety, as they call themselves, and be dispensational. You simply cannot. Right? And so if, if you're tempted by the universalist ideas and doctrines, you're rejecting your Bible and the truth of the Bible rightly divided. Right? And uh, I bring this up to guard you against being trapped by such rhetoric. But here, here's why it's a dispensational problem. When we draw our dispensational chart, we start from the Garden of Eden, do we not? And so we, we draw the Garden of Eden back here, and here's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and Adam and Eve, and then sin entered. Yes? And sin entered, and man fell by, by one man, sin entered, and death by sin. From that point on, you had death, and you had this nature that we're all born spiritually dead, needing Christ to revive us and save us. And so you have a, a period there of promise, where God gives promises to fathers, uh, of salvation, of how he will bless the world through this nation. And then on Mount Sinai, he gives the law, which seems to condemn a lot of people, but he gives this, this standard of righteousness, right, of how you can get blessed by blessing those who have it. He eventually sends Jesus Christ, who we know now will die on the cross for our sins, who provide the atonement uh, through his death, burial, and resurrection, so that now in this dispensation, we can preach the grace of God, and that through Paul's writings, or the Apostle Paul, and so that in the future, when Christ returns in judgment, right, uh, you will be saved by God's grace. But those who are not enter in through God's judgment, if not uh, finally judged to, to, to death and condemnation forever. So Christ will set up his kingdom over here, and here's his kingdom throne, and he will judge over heaven and earth and those under the earth forever. And we draw a chart generally like this, seeing that there's different ways in which God operates with humanity in which man responds to him. This is the dispensational idea. There's further revelation, progressive revelation through the scripture. God operates differently. He flooded the earth. We didn't draw the ark back here, but he flooded the earth at one point. He's not doing that all the time. He made a garden for people and provided all what they needed in the garden. He's not doing that all the time. But universalists tend to preach sin as if it's the Garden of Eden. Like, we're innocent. Why is God judging? Now, in the Garden of Eden, God made Adam and even put him there, and suddenly he's throwing lightning bolts at him. Like, this is how universalists preach what God is doing. That sin is like back here, but that's not true. By one man's sin and death by sin, from then on, death is the problem. Man is deserving of judgment. So they preach sin as if it's the Garden of Eden. It's not. And they preach heaven like we're over here in glory already. The church is in heaven over here. And God's ruling over heaven and earth as if God's love, which will be expressed in his glory over here to the saved, is like heaven right now. So God is so loving that he wouldn't send anyone to hell. True about those in heaven. Right? Not true about those today or here on the earth. So they're getting how God operates with humanity wrong. And this is a dispensational problem at the heart. They don't know how God's operating today and forever. And this is why we draw dispensational charts, to know what God is doing, right, and how he responds to humanity and how we should respond to him. So it's a dispensational problem at the very least. And I'm talking here to 
to those who believe the Bible is their authority, who say, well, we can be Christian and believe the Bible and still be this. You can't rightly divide the Bible. And that's a big problem. They see contradictions in God's own character and judgment and love. Well, we've already seen that's not contradictory. The dispensational idea to solving contradictions is what? That the contradictions in the Bible are apparent contradictions, or they're not real contradictions. Does God say circumcision is required or not in the Bible? Yes and yes. Yeah, it's like, yes. Uh, required here, not required here, right? Not a contradiction if you understand the progressive revelation in the context of the Scripture. Well, how can God be an all-loving God and then God be a God of justice? Um, dispensational context. God returns to judge and make war. God dispenses His grace to the world. Different ways God operates. Amen. So, see, the heart of this is really understanding the Bible dispensationally and knowing the reality of the teachings that we learn through progressive revelation, sin and death and judgment and, and so on, okay? They'll say, well, Paul's a pattern of how all men will be saved. Christ appeared to him, and Paul fell down and repented and believed in salvation. So when Christ appears to all in hell, then they'll fall down just like Paul did and be saved because his appearance to them. But 1 Timothy 1.16 says Paul's a pattern, not for those in hell, but for those now. In 1 Corinthians 15.8, Paul says he was born out of due time. Well, that has two meanings. One, it's out of due time, meaning he's a Jew and the kingdom's not here yet. But it's also out of due time because he's saved by grace, and it's not talking about hell. Right? And so Paul's not the pattern in hell, but in life, is what he says, for all those that should hereafter believe. Amen. Right? Can you believe in hell? Can you say, you know what, I missed my chance in life before death, but now I'm in hell, I'll finally believe. Right? And you can see where it's not just the universal we're talking about here. This is most of humanity who thinks that if God's real, I'll know when I die, and then I'll get right with him. See, that's the natural thought. But that's not going to be. This is why we preach. Because that's not true. If it were true, then sure. Well, don't believe me? Fine. Just talk to God later when you see him. You know. Well, if, if there's no hope there, then that's a real condemnatory attitude, isn't it? If there's no hope, then you just saying, fine, talk to God. Is you condemning people to hell, but I'm preaching the gospel to them. So there's a problem with that understanding that affects the way we minister to people and orientation towards them. In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 1, Paul says, the day of salvation is now. Is now the day of salvation or not? It is. Is there a time in which it's no longer the day of salvation? Yes. The Bible says yes. It's not the day of salvation when God judges the nations and throws them to everlasting fire, which the Bible says. That's not the day of salvation, that's the day of judgment. But universalism is in a corner, and they require that in the end all be saved, which means in hell, from hell, which hell is a judgment, isn't it? Yeah. Or is hell a grace and a mercy? You see, you see, if it were a place to be saved, it would be a grace. You see? So they're confusing the biblical descriptions of it. So it's not good enough just to say, I have an optimism, just a hope against hope. You can't have a hope if the Bible doesn't describe it. If the Bible doesn't give you the hope, you have no hope. You see, if Christ doesn't give you the hope, there is none. Why did Jesus need to die a horrible and painful death and suffering and keep it secret of what he was doing if there's hope for salvation from hell? Right? It's not just that he died, because people say, well, he had to die to atone for the world. Yes, he did. Why did he need to keep it a secret? I mean, dispensationally, we know that what he did on the cross was kept secret. Right? 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7 says that. Hidden wisdom ordained before the world unto our glory. Why was it kept secret? Because he had to accomplish this or else risk hell for everyone. Right? There's a dispensational importance to understanding this concept of whether salvation is in hell or not. Salvation is now revealed to be believed unto all. Remember in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21, where Paul says that it was by the foolishness of preaching that it pleases God to save them that believe? Well, if there's, let's, let's put hell up here, because here's, here's the judgment, okay, and there's hell. The universalist says you can be saved out of it, all right? So we're talking about whether or not there's hope here. If our hope is here, right, and we preach, actually, in the end, everyone's hope will be from there. You see how this misdirects where our hope's at? Right? Is the preaching of the cross happening in hell? Paul says it's by the preaching of the cross that men are saved. 
Well, if, if that be true for every dispensation, which by the way, we know it not to be, because dispensations change, but assuming that were true against all what the Bible says, is, says, then who's preaching the cross in hell? It's not you, right? It's not Israel. Well, didn't Jesus go down to the spirits in prison? It doesn't talk about, about him preaching the cross to them, like getting them saved, all right? And that's just one verse from the, from, from the scripture. But God shows the foolishness of preaching. Is there preachers in hell? Right? That would have to be what would have to be if there was hope in hell by the pollution of preaching. Romans 11.32 says, God counted them all to unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Romans 11 is talking about Israel. And you'll see here in a little bit that this is often a subject confused in this idea of purgatory or post-death salvation or restoration is confusing Israel with everybody. This is a dispensational issue. Okay? Romans 11 is Paul talking about the return of Israel. Israel. Not the Gentiles, not the world, not all the dead, but Israel. In Romans 11.32, Paul says, God concluded them all, them being Israel, in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. All who? Israel. Right? And so, where does God have mercy upon Israel? Does he bring them back from hell? No. <laughs> he doesn't. He offers salvation, and then he brings them back into their kingdom here. Either the dead believing or those that are alive and that believe that Israel may be saved as a nation on the earth. He doesn't come back from hell to bring Israel back from hell. And even if he were, it doesn't prove anything about anyone else. God's mercy is not shown in hell, that he might have mercy upon all. His mercy is not hell, right? His mercy is in the time he's given you in this life, which you don't deserve, by the way. And in Christ's atonement for your sins, which is preached and available to all that believe today, that's his mercy, that's his grace. Amen. Not this. All right. 2 Peter 3, verse 6. Even Peter preaches against this, this idea when he says that God is long-suffering. In chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, his promise of salvation, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. God doesn't want anyone to perish. We well, see, there it is. God's going to save everybody. He doesn't want anyone to perish. That's what God's heart is. He doesn't want anyone to perish. And I totally believe it. Right? Well, we've already covered before. The universalists will say, because God wills it, like the Calvinist, it will happen against everyone else's will. Right? We've already dealt with that. But it says here, God will not have anyone to perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God is going to wait around long-suffering for people in hell until they repent. And in the end, they'll all be saved out of it. Is Peter teaching that in 2 Peter 3? No. He's talking about what's going on now, in his time, when Paul was alive, when Peter was alive, and they're asking Peter, where's this kingdom? And Peter goes, well, listen to Paul. He'll say this in the next couple of verses. He says, God is long-suffering. He's, he's postponing the kingdom, suffering the sins of the world, so that they might be saved. Peter's testifying to the long-suffering of God in this dispensation, not in hell. That, that's, the, that's the teaching, is that he'll wait forever in hell until they repent and, and believe and get saved out of it. What happens to those who don't believe? Look at verse 6. There are those who deny God's judgment, is what Peter teaches. He says, they're willingly ignorant, verse 5, of the judgment of God, of here the flood of the earth, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. God doesn't want any to perish. Did they perish? Yes. Verse 7, when the, heav the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved. So the heavens that are now, Peter says, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. What does Peter teach right before he says God's long suffering? There's a day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Then he says, the reason why this hasn't happened yet is because God's trying to save people from that. He's not teaching God's waiting around for eternity for people to be saved from here. It's not in the Bible. Okay? And it's a dispensational issue. Peter talks about different dispensations there. He's talking about God's saving now, God's kingdom come, day of judgment. Yes. It's about different things that God's doing. So you see the dispensational problem here with thinking there's hope in hell? Like you're getting some things wrong here. The dispensation of the long suffering of God is the dispensation of the grace of God, it's not hell. Hell is not the dispensation of God's grace. It's the dispensation of his judgment and righteousness. Okay? 
Universalists have to invent, actually. You see why I drew this line here? I should have drawn a different color because this is not the biblical teaching, but this is the universalist teaching, and that's a resurrection from hell that they invent. This is nowhere taught in the Scripture. There's a resurrection that you have into heaven. There's a resurrection Israel has into the kingdom. There's a resurrection in Revelation 20. There's not a resurrection there. Show me the verse that says resurrection out of hell. It never is. And so this is what necessarily must follow. If there's a hope in hell, there's got to be a resurrection from hell. In fact, what do we learn in Revelation 20? God throws death into hell. Death itself. If there's no more death, there can be no resurrection from the dead. Amen. Do you understand? Because resurrection's from death. If you don't die, there is no resurrection. Yes? If once you're dead and there's no more death to actually conquer, then sorry. This is exactly why he made death a possibility for humanity. To be able to save them. You know, the devil doesn't die, and angels don't die. There's no hope for them. But humanity, in God's wisdom, provided hope when he said, if you eat that, you'll die. And they shouldn't have ate it. But through death, Christ would defeat death and allow resurrection to give life to humanity. Amen. Well, where's the resurrection when there's no death? It's thrown into hell too. Right? God's done with that. He's done working with it. Universalism commits the error that is often thrown at dispensationalists, and wrongly so. The, 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 the typical caricature of dispensational Bible study is that we believe the rapture as the key doctrine. The rapture is our thing, and we believe in pre-tribulation. Pre this, is, this is what makes us dispensational. I think this is not true at all. It's a consequence of some dispensational teaching, but it's not the premise. It's not the starting point. It's not the chief doctrine. And making the eschatology, the rapture and pre-tribulation, the key component of dispensational understanding is a wrong way to study the Bible. You don't take the end time belief and interpret the rest of the Bible by it. You interpret the Bible to determine what will happen in the end time. Right? That's the right way to study the Bible. And so dispensationalists who don't understand that do commit the error of saying, well, we've got to believe the rapture above all else. We've got to reinterpret everything in that light. Nope, that's the wrong way to do it. Read the Bible. Separate prophecy from mystery as the Bible teaches. Rightly divide the scriptures and you'll see the church is not Israel, and there's a resurrection given to the church that's not Israel's resurrection. This is what the rapture is, but my point is simply, don't interpret the Bible by your eschatology, by your end belief. It's precisely what universalism does. They believe in the end all will be saved, and they reinterpret the rest by that. That has to happen. We can't deny that. Why not? Does the Bible teach it? Right? No. Right. And so this is their error. Dispensational issue, yes. Let's deal with whether or not after you die, hell and the punishment and torment there can actually be a helpful thing. Can it be restorative? Because this is the argument that hell is not, yes, it's torment and punishment. Remember, these people at this point are, are believing the, the teaching of the Bible about it. But it, it's, it's something that will eventually change people's minds. It's something that will restore people. And this is related to, like I said, the doctrine of purgatory in the Catholic Church. Because universalism requires God, um, who makes hell... And he makes hell because he's gracious, not a God who makes hell because he's righteous. Like, that's what that requires. If hell is a restorative, purgative process whereby you get cleansed to go to heaven, and so you, you face fiery torment and burnings until all your sins are burned up, and then you fly off to heaven, right? And so how long is that? Well, as long as it takes for your sins to get burned up, but you'll go to heaven eventually, you know. And uh, the whole Catholic system of religion is based around this. In fact, I forgot to bring it today, and I'm not wearing it today unless you think I am. But um, if you go to freebrownscapular.com, if it still exists, you can get a brown scapular. Say, a what? Some of you know, some of you don't know. Scapular, shaking your head. It's a small piece of brown cloth, and the string you wear about your neck, that has been blessed historically, supposedly, by certain saints. Right? So that if you're wearing the brown scapular, when you die, you get, a purga get out a purgatory free card. That's what it is. You skip purgatory and go straight to glory. Just wear the brown piece of cloth around your neck. And you say, really? Really? That's what's taught. And not only the brown scapular, but many other amulets and pro objects and things like that by which if you go and kiss a saint's feet or see the jawbone of John the Baptist or what have you, the toenail of St. Thomas or something, then you can receive a special blessing so that you spend less time in purgatory. Now, this is all laughable, but this is because we've come from a Protestant tradition that has long ago discarded all the relics of mysticism and nonsense in this religion. But to this day, Roman Catholicism teaches things like that. 
that purgatory is real, that when people die, believing people. There are the wicked who don't believe and will be condemned forever in hell, okay? But then there's even believers who we all go to purgatory because you don't die in perfection, do you? You say, well, no, no, none of us are perfect. Great. And heaven's a perfect place, and so to get from your imperfect place to perfect place, there has to be a time of cleanup. It's like the Wizard of Oz before they actually meet the wizard. You gotta clean you all up and everything. And it may hurt a little bit. Did you ever see the scarecrow during that time? It's terrible. He was rubbing things out. But it's terrible. But you'll meet the wizard eventually, right? And that's purgatory, okay? Uh, would it shock you to know that purgatory is not taught in the Bible? It's not there. There's not a teaching. There is a teaching of judgment, torment, and punishment. There's a teaching of God's judgment of people who are alive on the earth. But there's not a teaching of those who believe and trust God go through a time of death purgation. After death, purging. After death, cleansing and torment. And then you get released to the pearly gates in heaven. Not taught anywhere in the scripture. Okay? The closest you get, one of the strongest passages that are used, and by the way, this is only brought up because as people argue the, the question of where is it at in the Bible, which I might remind you that the Catholics aren't too concerned of whether or not the Bible contains every truth that you need to believe because they hold as their authority not just the scripture but tradition. And so there's a development of doctrine the church can provide that's extra biblical that is just as true, right? Do you see how this doctrine can fit in that? If the Bible doesn't teach this, well, yeah, it doesn't matter. The Mormons do the same thing. So if the Mormons, Catholics do the same thing in this regard, the Catholics add tradition to scriptural authority. What do the Mormons do? Take the Bible and you add the Book of Mormon. The Bible doesn't say that. Yeah, well, they got the Book of Mormon here. You got the Pearl of Great Price. It teaches it. The Maccabees, the Apocrypha teaches it. That's not Bible, right? It's extra biblical, you see, and they're adding it to the scripture. And this is the only way you can possibly believe in universalism. Okay, it's not in the scripture. Well, maybe there's truths that aren't in the Bible that we can know from other authorities, like tradition, or our heart, or something, you know. But for Corinthians 3.15, when it's asked, where in the Bible is it taught, they normally come to the Bible, try to find places, and I know this is kind of pejorative, me saying that, but it just seems kind of obvious historically, because it was not, the doctrine wasn't proved from Scripture, it was something that was proved by philosophy and deduction on a misunderstanding of God's glorification process. But in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 15, <clears throat> is Paul's teaching of the judgment, seat of Christ. And he's talking about, we all will face this judgment. He's talking about believers here. So you can see how this fits with purgatory. It's believers in 1 Corinthians 3. And he says in verse 13, or verse 11, if other foundation can no man lay than that, than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Paul's the master builder of verse 10, by the way. He's the one laying the foundation here. If any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hand, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. So you're building on the foundation with these elements. <clears throat> you're not actually handling gold, by the way, right? This, it's a figure. But you're building with elements like gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hand, stubble that will eventually be uh, tested by fire is what the figure is here. And of course the elements remain are the metals here, gold, silver, and precious stones, and we know by fire in our natural existence that wood, hand, stubble will not remain through the fire. This is why Paul brings it up. He says in verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it, it, what? The work shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So there it is. So he's saved as by fire, so he's put through the fire, he's burned up a little bit, and then he comes out glorious, right? It's the work that's tested, folks, not the person. It's the work that's burned up, not the person. It's the work that's gold, silver, precious stones, not the person. You see, is it that simple? That, that's really it. They, they will interpret the verse as saying it's the person, or the person and the work are tied together. It's, but it's the work. The man is saved. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Why? Because the work he did was in vain. But he himself shall be saved. It says right there. Well, if he's saved, he's saved from what? From the burning up. Right? Yet so is by fire. If someone's house is on fire, and you call them up immediately and say, are you okay? And they say, I'm fine, but I lost everything in my fire. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean that they got scars, burn scars all over them? No, they're saved. They did not get burned. Right? 
The things they possessed got burned up. Purgatory is if they stayed in the house, felt the flames of fire, came out and said, I'm still alive. That would be purgatory, right? But Paul's talking about you not going through the fire. It's the works. You're saved yet so as by fire. You're saved even though there's fire of your works and things like that. So this is the doctrine of 1 Corinthians 3, verse 15. In fact, there's many places elsewhere where it's very clear that your glorification, I'm talking to believers now, right? The glorification of believers happens immediately yeah. upon death. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, the doctrine teaches, most people read this and if you're dispensational, you're going, oh, it's a rapture verse. Just, just put rapture on the shelf for a second, okay? I'm not even trying to prove rapture. Just read what the verse is saying about those that get changed here. How long does it take for someone to get changed to glory? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Yes, of course, we'll all go through the fires of purgatory and come out glorious. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. You see, this is the glorification. How long does it take to happen? In a moment. Now, you go on and read this, you say, well, this, this sounds like the rapture of those that are yet alive. Because it says, those, we won't all sleep, we won't all die. Well, that's true. But it, this instantaneous glorification happens not only for those that are alive that get changed, but those that are dead that change as well. Or did these people escape purgatory because they're alive when Christ returns? All right. Paul talks about to be absent from the body is to be in purgatory, right? <laughs> Present with the Lord in purgatory, in facing torment from the Lord. No, that's not what the teaching is. Philippians 1.21, to live as Christ and to die is a short period of torment until I get purged. To die is gain. Like, it wouldn't be true at all. If purgatory is reality in Paul's mind, to say to die is gain, he would say, I, I'll just stay here until I can get my brown scapular and say enough prayers. And then when I'm confident that St. Mary will let me into heaven immediately, then I'll die. Right? But that's not the case. You know how much money has been given to Catholic churches in the name of people who are dead? Because they, they, people love people that have died in unbelief. They love them. And if they're told there's a way to save them from hell, if there's if just something you can do, and against understanding of Bible, because most people don't, they'll say, fine, yes, what do you need? What do you want? Say a prayer, go to Mass, some money? Sure. If it guarantees their forgiveness from hell, I'm there. What do the Mormons do? Water baptize people who are dead. Why? To get them saved. Yeah. Saved out of hell. Right? So you see, I'm not, even not just talking about universalism today. It's, it's Catholics, it's Mormons. There's a common teaching that... You go to hell as a second chance, you can get out of there, people can help you with it. When Catholics die, they say at their funeral, we'll assist them with, their, with our prayers. So our prayers can assist those that are dead to get out of purgatory faster, right? It's like, is that true or not? How are people's sins purged? How are they cleaned? Is it through the fires of hell, through your prayers and through your donations, or through the cross of Christ? Yeah. And so, stepping away from universalism for a moment, Paul says it's Christ. You are one with Christ right now. Nothing separates you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, Romans chapter 8. And then when you die, we're supposed to believe you go to purgatory? No. I am one with Christ. He has declared me righteous by faith. He has sanctified me, given me a heavenly position with him in Ephesians 2, verse 6 and 7. Okay? And I am washed. 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says... You are washed, you are justified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. If I'm washed now, now I'm talking about water baptism, I'm talking about Jesus Christ and his blood, then what makes me have the need to be cleansed after I die? Nothing. When I die, the sinful mortal flesh I have drops dead and God gives me a new body. Amen. I'm with him, I'm redeemed, I'm alive with him forever. See, th this is why this issue is important. It affects what people think is the gospel and the way of salvation and how to get out of God's judgment. Universalism necessarily from the Bible must push your opportunity for salvation here. And there's simply no hope there. And this is a great problem. For the universalist, <clears throat> the most effective salvation program is hell. You understand that? 
Remember, the whole argument by the Universalists is that you claim to believe in a hell, which means the majority of humanity is burning in hell and the minority are saved, which, by the way, they've never really calculated that very well because there's a lot of dead babies who go to heaven and things like that. And you really don't know who's saved and who's not. And apart from that, God doesn't obligate himself to save even an individual, a single person. If only one person was saved, it would be God's eternal glory. He doesn't, we don't deserve salvation at all. But if it were true and that a majority of living people, living past the age of five, which is probably true, have died without faith in Jesus Christ, and universalists believe they'll all be saved in hell. That means the greatest salvation time is here. Right? More people will be saved in hell than any other time in human history. In hell. Like, that, that's the glory of God. It's like, he puts you in torment and fire, and that's how you're going to get saved. That's not what the Bible teaches, folks. It teaches salvation through faith and belief in what Christ did in the past, not what he'll do to you in hell. Right? That's not the message. And so, death, judgment. Look at Hebrews 9. Look over a few verses here, whether or not the Bible teaches a restoration period of purgatory. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It's appointed unto men <clears throat> once to die, but after this, the judgment. The timeline of your life will be birth, life, hopefully salvation in there, death, judgment. You face God in judgment. You face God in judgment, and if you don't believe, you're in hell. This has already been established and agreed upon. So if you face God in judgment, Revelation 20, the people are going to lake of fire, going into hell. The universalist claims that now that you're in hell, you can be saved. Does Hebrews 9, 27 communicate anything like that idea? There's death and judgment. And don't worry, I'm just not mentioning it, but there's also another opportunity after, after death. No, that's it. It teaches that's the end. Like the finality is God's judgment. In fact, we covered in a previous lesson how it's a righteous thing at the last thing that occurs, an opportunity for your salvation is his judgment. That's it, not hell. Because it's unjust for God to allow, his, uh, allow people to continue without a final judgment. But that was in a previous lesson. Look at Psalm 6, verse 5. <clears throat> In the book of Psalms, does the Bible teach that, does, does the Bible teach anywhere that the, the hell, going to the grave and condemnation and hell that's there, is something that restores you? Psalm 6, 5 says, For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? Now David's obviously talking about those that are alive, talking about those who are dead, and says you can't thank God when you're dead. But what's the universalist say? Yes, you can go to hell, well, that's ultimately when everyone will glorify God and thank him. It's from hell. All right? They'll be saved out of it. And they'll remember God. They'll go to hell and remember God and what he did. What's, what's David say? In death there's no remembrance of God, no remembrance of thee. They do not change their mind in hell. Psalm 88. Now is the day of salvation. God's life. In fact, this, this goes back to God's purpose of even granting life and then death, like this period of time where we face a little bit of suffering and tragedy on this earth before we die. Why does God even do that? Why don't you just hold the judgment immediately or something? Or as soon as you believe, he judges you when you believe or something. Why didn't he do it a while ago? Why did he even allow this to continue as long as it has? <clears throat> why? Because the opportunity to be saved is in your life. That's why. Why does he allow all these sinners, all these uh, murderers and, and to continue? Because salvation opportunity is in their life. That's why. Psalm 88. When they die, there's no more opportunity. <clears throat> that's the teaching of the scriptures. Psalm 88. <clears throat> We're in verse 1. O Lord, <clears throat> 11 is what I need, thank you. Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave? It's rhetorical, folks. The answer in Psalm 88 is no. Right? He's going down through here saying, will your loving kindness be declared in the great? Well, no. It's declared to the living. Right? The heavens and nature sing and all of that, as the song say, because of nature that God's trying to communicate mercy to you. Every breath you take is a mercy. When you die, it's done. Okay? Revelation 9, you say, well, but when they feel the torment of God, they feel God's righteous judgment, it will, it will change their mind. I mean, who can actually be in hell, who can face God's wrath, and not you know, change their mind? You mean under duress, or what? Because I, I can understand that happens. Anyone will do anything when they're in enough pain, I suppose. But is that actually what happens? Does God's wrath get poured out and people change their mind as a result? Look at Revelation 9, verse 20, where God's wrath is being poured out. 
Here they're being tortured, tormented, okay, by these beings. And it says, the rest of the men, now these are living men on the earth, not in hell, but on the earth. The rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and the idols of gold and silver. And these people know Jesus Christ is coming. Yeah. In Revelation 6, they look up and say, save us from the Lord. Save us from the Lord, is what they say. They don't repent. Verse 21, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor their fornication, nor of their thefts. They didn't repent. Look at Revelation 16. Or they won't, right? This is future. Revelation 16, verse 8. The fourth angel poured out his vial, his vial of wrath. Okay. This is God's wrath. People argue whether God's wrath is in hell. Well, of course it's in hell. But even if it weren't in hell, God's pouring out wrath here. He's pouring out his wrath in Revelation 16. In verse 8. And it says... Um, the vial was poured out on the sun. The power was given to them to scorch men with fire. Sounds like hell to me, hell on earth, quite literally. And it says, the men were scorched with great heat. So this is very detailed. Now this is not describing hell. This is describing God's wrath on earth. And blasphemed the name of God. So as a result of this scorching heat, they didn't say, okay, 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 I'm sorry. They said something I can't say about God, <laughs> right? which hath power over those plagues, and they re repented not to give him glory. It doesn't result in people's changed mind when they face God's righteous judgment, which is why God withholds his judgment and long-suffering to save people, and they reject the opportunity. Jeremiah 9, God talks uh, through Jeremiah, it says that he's going to punish Israel with judgment because their hearts are hard, and he does so, and they're not going to repent. It's like their hearts will be hardened as a result. Read the story of Exodus with Pharaoh. You know, the Calvinist loves that. They say, God hardened his heart. He hardened his heart because of the plagues he sent against him. That's how he did it. Yeah. He didn't harden his heart by reaching into his heart and twisting it so that he responds a certain way. He did it by pouring out the plagues instead of asking nicely and nicely and nicely, which you never harden someone's heart by asking nicely. Mm -hmm. If you ask really, really nice, no one's heart is hard. And they're just like, you're kind of annoying and cute, but you know, please stop. You harden someone's heart by saying, you're going to hell if you don't believe. I will never talk to you again. That's all it happens. You harden someone's heart by... By judgment, okay? Which is why Christians don't want to judge. They want to harden hearts, right? But the, the point is, if you don't believe, your heart will be hardened by God's righteous judgment in hell, not repent. It will not be softened by it, okay? But universal you know, requires your heart be softened by the fires of hell, okay? Isaiah 6, 9, and 10, God sends Isaiah out to preach to Israel in their time of judgment. This is on earth again, not in hell. And it sends Isaiah out so they will not be converted. Do you remember that? Multiple times, Jesus and the prophets of the Old Testament are sent out so that Israel will not believe. It kind of flies in the face of the fact that God pours out judgment so that men will believe. When judgment gets poured out, the time of belief is over. The opportunity for mercy is over. God's grace, through faith, is done. And even at those times, in Revelation, when he's pouring out plagues, there's angels flying around saying, believe, you know. And they reject those angels. Remember in Romans chapter 9, verse 3, where God, or Paul says, I have a desire for my kinsmen in the flesh that they might be saved. Remember that? Romans 10, verse 1, Romans 9, 3, Paul says, I have, a, I have a desire in my heart for my kinsmen in the flesh that they might be saved. If Paul believes this doctrine, that they'll be saved from hell, then what is he saying? He has a heart's desire that they might be saved. Paul, don't you know they're all going to be saved in the end? Paul, you're the one teaching God's abundant grace. Don't you know they're all going to be saved in the end? No, he doesn't communicate that. His heart's desire to save them now because they won't be. All right? There's no need for the cross if hell can purge sins and cleanse you, right? What purges your sins? The fires of hell or the cross of Christ? This is the dilemma here. I mean, it should be a simple one. If you don't fall into the errors of Catholicism or Mormonism or Universalism. It's that the cross of Christ does that. By the way, if you go to hell and it's there to restore you, then it's no longer punishment, right? It's no longer retributive. It's no punishment. You don't go to hell then as punishment, as a consequence of sins, which you already established is a necessary consequence of sins. Right? It's no longer punishment. It's there to help you. It's like the physical trainer that comes and says, all right, a lot of pain is going to happen, but I'm here to help you. And guess what? You willingly pay him because you want the help. That's not the case in hell. People don't willingly go there, and they don't accept it as help. They harden their hearts against it. Yeah. Okay. 
Restoration of the universe will happen in the end. When, even in the judgment, after hell, restoration will occur. But restoration doesn't require the salvation of all people. Amen. When God talks about restoration, He's talking about the restoration of peace in the universe. Like the ultimate you know, Miss America wish. God will bring true when Christ over all reigns in glory and peace of the universe. Well, if there's peace, how can there be burning in hell? Let me give you the picture, okay? This might be familiar to some of you in America. I don't know. But let's say you had a village, a town like Greentown, and uh, the police and law enforcement said, you know, we have laws, we're simply not going to enforce them whatsoever. Like, crime goes up, right? Crime. Things become terrible, right? Just people running rampant. But we're showing mercy and grace to these criminals. We're like, okay, they're stealing and doing bad things. We're, we're, we're trying to, to help them be restored, right? But they just never do. They keep stealing and this sort of thing. They keep doing wrong. And then one day, the police say, you know what? We had enough of this. We're going to enforce the law. And they crack down and throw every criminal in prison. What do the honest people in the town do? Yay! Justice is restored. There's peace in our village. How can you say there's peace? There's people in prison tonight. They don't have a, a, a soft bed to lay on. They were criminals. That's the consequence of their sin. Peace is restored in the universe because God satisfies his justice, not just in people going to hell, but in everywhere else being protected by sin. That's the restoration as a result of hell. It doesn't require the people in hell come out. But see, that's the, that's the thinking, the premise of universalism, that restoration can only occur if these people get out of hell. Well, this is a sympathy towards the criminal, right? Instead of toward Christ and God. It's, and the innocent, it's, it's towards the criminal. And that's natural because we are criminals too. So wouldn't you sympathize with the criminal? But that's not required for God's righteous judgment to restore the universe, okay? It doesn't require every man to be saved. There's no biblical example of any unbeliever coming to faith after death. There's no single biblical example of an unbeliever coming to faith after death. In fact, it's the opposite. Now, follow with me through a series of verses here. I said at the beginning that it's not just that it's something the Bible doesn't teach, it's actually something the Bible teaches against, this idea of endless opportunity to be saved. The Bible teaches against it, which is why there's an urgency for people to be saved. Because you don't know when death will happen to you and your opportunity is done. Luke chapter 16. I go here and people familiar with the issue say, well, oh, this is a parable, this is a parable. It doesn't matter if it is or not. It isn't, which we covered before. It's not. But it doesn't matter if it is or not, because Jesus is teaching something through this, either real story or parable. And so forget whether it is or not. It is not. But either way, what Jesus says in this teaching is Luke 16, verse 25. Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receives thy good offerings. And this is the rich man who's in hell. He sees, he's in torments and sees Lazarus over there. And he wants some water to cool his tongue in this tormented flame. And Abraham, remember, likewise, Lazarus received evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, cannot pass. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. You can't go to hell from heaven. The people in hell can't go to heaven. They cannot. That's what Abraham says. Wow. So either Jesus is creating an untrue hypothetical or something we can learn about this passage is that you can't go from one place to the other after you're judged after death. Matthew 25, 33, Jesus even states, can you escape the damnation of hell? Jesus asked that rhetorical question. The Lord of glory, can you escape the, 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 the eternal damnation of hell? And are we supposed to respond with, yes, of course we can. Jesus is saying, no, you cannot escape the damnation of hell. Right. Mark chapter 3, verse 29, the teaching of the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost says that it will not be forgiven you, the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, right? Either in this life or, or, or in... The next is what Matthew will say. Matthew 3, verse 29 says, He that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost has never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. The time link there is important, which we covered last week, but never forgiveness. So it's not that you go to hell because you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, and then 
You can repent and get forgiven. It's never there. Mark chapter 9, verse 44. This is why we covered eternal last week, by the way, because I don't want to get in the arguments about that. We're trying to figure out whether there's an opportunity preached, because you would think that if there is an opportunity for the greatest salvation event ever, it would be communicated in the Scripture. Mark 9, 44. Contrary to that, the greatest opportunity for salvation the Bible ever knows is, is in this dispensation. Salvation by grace through faith to save more people. This is the beginning of the world. Mark 9, 44. He says, It's better that you enter into life maimed than having two hands go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. And usually the argument around this verse about the worms and the fire is the literalness of the worm and the fire. Like, you're missing the point. The verse says, the worm and the fire, literal, allegorical, doesn't matter, is not quenched. Yes. It dies not. Forever. Right? The corruption, destruction, whatever you want to make that to be, the actual fires never end. And you're going there. Right? He says it three times, where the worm dies not, the fire is not quenched. Where the worm dies not, the fire is not quenched. In John chapter 3, verse 36, These are some biblical passages that allude to the question of, is there hope after we die? Only in Christ, folks. Is there endless opportunity? John 3, 36 says, He that believes on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believes not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Abides. It doesn't visit there and then go away. Like That's his, that's his, Lord, that's his home now. Right? That's John 3.36. Now, this isn't even the gospel grace of God. But we see the teaching about the permanency of hell. John 8, verse 21. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die. So he's talking here to people who don't believe. Ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Where I go, ye cannot come. Because you die in your sins. If you die in your sins, you can't go where Jesus is at. You can't go to glory. You can't go to heaven. You can't go to peace on earth, goodwill toward men. You can't go there if you die in your sins. You need to get your sins dealt with. Christ dealt with it. Trust is finished on the cross, right? John 8, 23. Ye are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. People say, how can God judge his children in hell? They're not his children. That's why. They're from there. They're going home because that's where they're from. They're children of hell. They're children of the devil. That's where they're going. And the teaching is, well, they'll go home and realize that I don't want to be here, and this, this is not my home. I don't want to be here anymore. Is there endless opportunity like that? In Hebrews 10, verse 26, the author of Hebrews says, there's no more sacrifice for sins. After judgment, there's no more sacrifice for sins. If you sin willfully, there's only a certain, fearful, looking for of judgment and indignation. Certain. Like, well, can we question that a little bit? Because, I mean, maybe, maybe it's a little less certain than certain. In fact, certainty is the ultimate sin in the postmodern world, you know. The Bible says certain, fearful looking for judgment. In fact, there's only a few places the Bible uses the word certain, and it's, it's weird that a couple of places it's about hell and judgment. If there's anything certain the world says, there's two sure things, what are they? Death and taxes. Yeah. And they laugh because the taxes part. Well, the death's the first part, you know. That came from the Bible. It's like, yeah, death is certain to us all. And the judgment that follows, and the hell that follows that, if you don't get saved through Jesus Christ. Right? Thank God there's no taxes in hell, but it's worse. <laughs> yeah. But death is forever. All right. Philippians 3.19, Paul weeps. Why does he weep? Because it's a reality that those who are enemies of the cross of Christ have an end in destruction. The Christian universalist teaching is, in the end, all will be saved. What's Paul say about the end? Their end is destruction. There's nothing after the destruction that causes their salvation. Their end is destruction. That's why he weeps for their being enemies of the cross, and he wants to preach them that they might be saved from their destruction. And look, look at Luke 13. We were here last week as well, but talking about the eternal nature of hell, but Luke 13, verse 22. He went through the, the, the cities and villages teaching... And journeying toward Jerusalem, this said one to him, Lord, are there few that be saved? How many are saved? We dealt with this a few weeks back. And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will, not, will seek to enter uh, in and shall not be able. So there's a lack of ability to enter in here, right? 
When, when, when are they not able to enter in? When once the master of the house is risen up, it hath shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without, and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he says, I never knew you. I know not from whence you are, right? You're not familiar to me, you're not family to me. This is Jesus talking about when the door is shut. The only question would be was when is the door shut? But there's a door that's shut, and people outside that door. The universalists would have us think that that door is shut, and they keep knocking and knocking, I want in, I want in. Eventually Jesus says, if, I knock, if, if you knock, I'll let you in. It's the opposite of Revelation 3, where Jesus says he's knocking, right? It, it's, if you knock, eventually I'll let you in. But not the first time, apparently, because Jesus responds with, I don't know who you are. Knock, knock, who's there? Oh, everyone's saved. That's the joke. Because Jesus doesn't let him in the first time. But he will some other time. That's not what the Bible teaches. What will it take for people to change their mind in hell? You might ask that question. If there's endless opportunity, how long does it take? What does it take? We've already seen that God pours out his wrath and people don't repent. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And that day they started to plot his death. Okay, Jesus fed the thousands. They crucified him on a cross. What will it take? You see the fires of hell? You think they're going to repent from that? That's worse than being fed a good meal. Right? This doesn't soften their hearts. How long will it take for people to come to faith? It, you know what? I give you a minimum here. I'll give you a minimum. You say, oh, how long do they have to be in the torments of hell before they can receive eternal life? The minimum has to be a thousand years. You say, well, that's a really long time. How, how, why do you say that? Because there's a thousand year kingdom. The final judgment happens at the end. So let's just assume against the Bible's description that at the final judgment, everyone gets saved right there. The thousand years over. So if you're dead and you're in hell until a you know, thousand years, then you, everyone goes to heaven. Because you were there long enough and you get purged and cleansed and everyone restored and all that. It's at least a thousand years. Well, tell me then, how is that any better? <laughs> you say, well, at least it's only a thousand years of torment. Right. What's there between a thousand years and a billion years, which is the definition of an eon? Or two billion years, three billion years? Well, at least they get out eventually. That's a long eventually, folks. This is why annihilationism, we didn't do a lot with it last week, but Annihilationism has its own issues, but it's different than universalism in that it acknowledges that not everyone gets saved. Annihilationism is the teaching that when you die, you're dead. Like punishment and judgment is forever because you're just dead and you don't exist anymore. Right? And uh, the, the difference is here, is that they recognize that just one minute, one, you know, one year, one, a thousand years is too long. And so their thinking is, you're done immediately. As long as it takes for a marshmallow to burn in the fire, that's how long you are, and then you're done. Right? So the universalist has a real issue here. You think all is going to be saved, because how long will it take for them to be saved? Right? It's different saying how long on the earth and how long in hell. There's a big difference. There's no more opportunity to repent at death. And the reason why that is, is because the opportunity is taken away. Every day you make up your mind to believe or not. We do this as Christians, to reckon that things true or not. But every day... You choose to believe God to receive salvation or not. Every day you, you realize your own sin and need of God or not. Now, once you're saved by God's grace, you're saved. I'm not saying you're saved repeatedly. What I'm saying is that every day is an opportunity for your response to God in faith or not. You're saved by grace through faith. But if every day you reject God's faith, then on the day you die, that's the time your mind has been made up. You don't die and then your mind changes. You've made your choice every day of your life, and then you stand before God in judgment. He says, it seems like your mind was made up. He says, oh, no, I was waiting for this. Like, that's, not, that's not how it works. Your everyday choice was made final. What makes you think when you're separated from your body, you're separated from this life in which God grants mercy to the unbelievers, that he'll grant you such mercy before him when you've already been condemned by your sin in judgment? So thus the preaching. Repent. Change your mind now. Do it now. I'll do it later. You, do, you don't know when. Like, do it now. It's too risky. You understand? Well, I've heard of people, you know, they, they, they lived their life in a good time of sin, and then they believed, and you don't know when death's going to happen. You don't know when Christ is going to return. Not to mention the fact that salvation actually benefits you. It's to your benefit to be saved by God's grace. Is there hope in hell? Shall we cover more verses? We, we've already seen that the Bible not only doesn't teach this idea, it teaches against it, saying that there's, there, there's, the door is shut and there's 
forever, never forgiveness. Isaiah 38, verse 18. I'll just read this to you. Isaiah 38, verse 18. The grave cannot praise thee. Death cannot celebrate thee. They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. Is there hope in hell? That's pretty clear. Well, that's just talking about the grave, not hell. Remember, they do the word play with hell and the grave. But even if it's the grave, there's no hope there. You see? There is no difference when you're dead, right? So that's Isaiah 38, 18. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 7. This is not just a casual idea. This is the reason why it's part of Christian teaching is not because Christians are hateful. God wants people to be saved. It's that this is the reality of our condemned situation and the glory of God's grace to save sinners from death forever. This is the seriousness of sin, folks. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 7. When a wicked man dies, his expectation shall perish, and the hope of unjust men perish. Hope is lost. While men are still alive, there is a hope for them. When they die, there's no hope for them. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches very clearly. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 32. The wicked is driven away in his wickedness, but the righteous hath hope in his death. The righteous dies and is saved because they're righteous. Right? The wicked dies, and what happens to the wicked? He's driven away. There's no hope for the wicked. Now, you could say, well, I just believe the annihilation, they're all dead. Like, well, that's not universalism, which is teaching that they get saved, or purgatory, which is that they'll get purged and come out. You know, no, this is, it's done. There's a finality to death. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. This is how Paul puts it. Paul puts it like this, that they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. He says, why do the unrighteous perish in verse 10, 2 Thessalonians 2? Because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. You do not learn to love the truth in hell. You're blind to it, you understand? In this life, you literally have light to see, literally, and spiritually are given light to see, so they might be saved. But in hell, what's hell described as? Darkness. You're spiritually and physically blind. You cannot see. You will not see. Because you receive not the love of the truth. If you love light, if you love life, if you love truth, if you love love, if you love mercy and grace, be saved. Trust the God who is all those things who wants to save you from hell. Amen. But you won't. They'll hear that and they say, eh. They don't want to. They reject it. They'll rather face hell. And they do. Okay. There's no hope in hell because the only hope is believing the gospel, the grace of God, the death and resurrection of Christ. Is it greater for God to suffer long or for God to end all suffering? Now, you say, well, isn't God ending suffering by taking people out of hell? No, he's ending, ending suffering by judging righteously. God is suffering. You understand that? I'm not going to get heretical here about God being immutable and that sort of thing. But God is long-suffering. He's long-suffering right now, waiting for people to be saved. The universalism teaching is that God will forever suffer. God will forever suffer, waiting for humanity to make their choice. No, that's not greater. What's greater is that God, who long suffers for weak and inferior humanity, puts an end to suffering so that he can manifest his glory no more in suffering because his justice and holiness and love is manifest completely and if that means the condemnation of those who rejected him, that is righteous, that is true, that is loving for the end of all suffering, so that those in heaven, people ask the question, we'll cover this maybe in the future, like, what, what about those who are in heaven? And we have people that we know that are in hell. I mean, we're going to be suffering in heaven? No. Why? Because God was an end to that. You will know the mind of God in heaven, the restoration of righteousness and love and peace. Well, you will not suffer because of people in hell. Amen. They will, but not you. And you'll understand the righteousness of it. Things you can't fathom today, being a part of mortal, sinful flesh. He'll change you and glorify you in incorruptibility, and you'll see the righteousness of it. The hope is in Jesus Christ. The hope is in God. And God already sent, in this dispensation, everything necessary for us to believe. The scripture, we have the entire Bible. So what has God done to save people? The Bible, 
which is the consequence of thousands of years of his intervention, right? He sent Jesus Christ. He sent the Holy Ghost. He sent preachers. He sent the nation of Israel in time past and will in the future. He sends angels in Revelation. What has he not done? Would be the question. Okay. Universalists want the conditions of this dispensation to last forever. They want an opportunity where people won't suffer too bad, but, you know, won't know the glories of heaven yet because they're not there. And yet we'll be given the opportunity to believe and hear and consider and repent at a message taught to them or preached at them. And maybe sometimes even their suffering might, might cause them to say, you know, what, I want to be saved from this. I don't want to be facing this anymore. You know what that describes? Now, Amen. your life. Yeah. You say, why is there suffering? God allows this much suffering so that you might realize that suffering's bad. Yeah. <laughs> why is there tragedy in the world? So that you might be saved from it. There is no peace here. There is no light here. So they want a second chance like unto now. This is the second chance. Amen. The world crucified Christ. He could have destroyed the world then. This is the second chance. This dispensation of grace. For humanity. You didn't deserve to exist. Do you understand that? Christ came to this earth and he was killed. He had a promise for Israel, but not to you. Right? 2,000 years later, you're born and you live your short little existence. And that wasn't owed to you, but it's to his glory that you do exist and that you are saved and that you can see others saved. You know what's universal? Salvation is universally available and accomplished for all by the cross of Jesus Christ. It's universally not applied to anyone until they believe. God, in one day in the future, all will submit to God universally. Heaven and earth, those under the earth, will bow down to God in submission. Amen. See, isn't that proof of salvation? Submission is not salvation. Every prisoner is submitted to the warden, or else the warden sets them straight, you know. That's submission. That's not salvation. But everything will be submitted to God. And universally, God will receive glory when he reigns over all things in Jesus Christ. That's universal. That's restored. But every kind of universalism, even the so-called Christian kind, makes the biblical record, makes the account of the Bible, the scriptures we've read today in the previous lessons, makes it a substory of their system. Because the, the, the people will not be convinced by what I've taught in these last 15 lessons. And they'll say, well, no, 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 because you're missing, and they'll say this, you're missing the big picture. We have covered the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and all that it teaches about every subject about universalism. And the Bible does not teach it. It teaches contrary to it. And they say, but the bigger picture. Where are you getting this bigger picture? They're creating a picture and making the Bible a substory of it. So they can discard it for the sake of the bigger picture. They invented the bigger picture. It's not in the Bible. If there is hope in hell, folks, then hell's not real. We'll go back in circles. If there's hope in hell, it's not hell. It's salvation. Right? Universalism's final hope is false. Do you see how damnable that is? Don't worry, everyone's going to be saved. Where? In hell. No. That's where people are damned. Salvation's now by the grace of God. What about those who are not saved? So you go back in the circle. That's why we're preaching. We don't want them to go there. So this will conclude our Universalism series. Hopefully that helped, and hopefully you realize the, the heart in which I tried to teach these lessons, to strengthen you as his, God's ambassadors and his evangelists, yeah. so that, not that we can condemn people, that's not the point of our message of ministry, is that we might understand and appreciate God's righteous judgment Amen. and offer his right love and atonement through the cross, so that men might be saved, Amen. that more might. And uh, Universalism doesn't, never has that opportunity to see more might be saved, because all will be in the end anyway, mm-hmm. right? But it's, it's up to the church, God left us here, to communicate salvation that some might be saved. So let's do that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace, and we thank you for the love you showed.